Yeah, the show, it, that was a great description of the show. Yeah, it's This American Life plus like your favorite professor and the cool things they like to think about. But with, but the, but the angle is uh, small corners in American life that are not weird because we're used to it, but really weird when you look at it really closely, right? So if you look hard enough, you'll find philosophy in the oddest places. And once you find it there, you start seeing it everywhere. So that's three years ago when I started the show. Um, um, I, that's what I was looking for, right? These kind of weird corners of American life that had a kind of unquestioned assumption or a hidden conflict. But the practices in that little corner seem so natural and part of the landscape of human life that you don't think of them as containing kind of deep commitments that you can question. But once you do, you start tugging at the string a little bit, um, things start unraveling. And this was the very first thing that I thought about. Um, it's one, the, one of the first stories um, that I found were in books and articles about, of all things, estate planning, right? Um, you should try doing this, you know, like look into an area that you, like, is really boring sounding and like weird and you know nothing about and see if there's something funny, right? So the first thing that I thought when I looked into this idea, the, the literature of estate planning, it's really about rich people trying to determine what happens after they die with their stuff, right? And if you think about that, that's a little weird, right? Because you, you have to think that it's still their stuff after they're dead, right? That you have to look to what they wanted to do with it, and then you got to get other people who are still alive to do something with it, right? That's a little weird, right? And as, as soon as I thought, well, why? Well, if you think of animals doing this, it's weird, right? If you think like, you know, you know Sammy the squirrel who has been on, in my tree for a long time just died, what would he want done with these nuts? Right? He probably wouldn't want me eating them, or, or, or you know, like, like that. And and outside of a culture of high accumulation, it's you wouldn't think that anybody would think about this kind of thing, right? It wouldn't. You, outside of outside of a, cul a culture that has enormous amounts of property and wealth concentrated amongst few people. Right? Well, we think that this is an, an issue, right? Probably when I die, there's going to be some old books that my daughter's going to have. I don't know what to do with this stuff, right? It's not like, you know, I don't have anything, right? <laughs> I don't. And it's not going to be a problem in my life about, you know, estate planning. But anyways, so you, you start tugging at this, and you end up finding really interesting stories. Why? Because um, we're unique amongst a lot of countries in being fascinated with private property, Right and pursuing of private property, and we have huge wealth inequality, and we have um, idiosyncratic billionaires. Right? You put that all together, and you find some interesting stuff. So I'm going to start by telling a, a couple of stories. Um, the first one I'm going to tell is the story of Augustus Bacon of Macon. Right? So this is the Macon Bacon story. Right? So Augustus Octavius Bacon. Think about that name, Augustus Octavius. He like named himself twice after the same emperor, right? Uh, or his parents did. Uh, Bacon was a Confederate um, was a Confederate veteran. Uh, 1894, he uh, uh, he was elected to the U.S. Senate, so he was a senator uh, uh, from the Confederate state of Georgia, and he was a you know plantation owner type. Um, yeah, that's a euphemism for something, right? Um, and when he died in 1914, he uh, bequeathed uh, his property to, uh, according to a very specific will. Uh, I'm going to play a little bit of uh, an estate attorney who described it. I'm going to walk over there to my laptop, plug it in, hopefully you'll hear the, uh, the, um, the description of what his estate he said the trust should be for the sole, perpetual, and unending use, benefit, enjoyment of white women, white girls, white boys, and white children of the city of Macon. It was a racially restricted trust. Okay, so that's the first part. Here's the second part. He made explicit, even back then, that he wasn't a racist. Right? <laughs> the second part of the part that I, he explicitly wrote in the will, uh, I have no ill will towards the Negro. Right? Uh, I, in fact, I love a lot of them. Right? What I am against is their integration. So, In their social relations, white and Negro should be forever separate and that they should not have the pleasure or recreation grounds to be used or enjoyed together and in common. 
Okay, so that's the first part of the story. Uh, and so this, and so it was enacted. And you have this beautiful park, Baconsfield Park. Um, it's really interesting. You should Google and see you know, the old paintings of Baconsfield Park. And this little corner of Macon, Georgia, that was uh, enjoyed by white children and white women and white men for about 50 years until 1963. Right? 1963, right? 64, Civil Rights Act comes. Um, and th there's a fight. Right? There's like, look, this guy, there wouldn't be this park without this guy. This guy bequeathed it on the condition that these wishes are satisfied and so forth. They take it up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court rules rightly because it's the civil rights era. Well, because it's a park, right, and it's a public municipal area, um, it is subject to the 14th Amendment, right? And so it must be integrated. Okay, fast forward six years. So this is what happens. Um, it's, that was the statement of the will, right? And so the trustees look at it and say, look, we can't continue to satisfy this guy's wishes in the way we implement and you know, work out this park because of the law. So the only thing we can do now is go to the Georgia State Court and say, this will is like unexecutable. I know there's a legal term for this, right? Like it's unexecutable or whatever that term is and must be overturned. Um, Okay, that's what they argued, right? Really what's going on is that black people started using the park and the trustees of the park thinks, think, this is bad, <laughs> right? And so they thought, what can we do to either prevent black people from using the park or just not, I, not rather not have a park than to have black people start using it? And what they found and what they argued in the court was that um, when you have something that is stated in somebody's will, that you can't legally execute anymore. That means that will is null and void. And so what you should do with the property is it should go to whatever the heirs would be at this point in time. Those heirs, as a matter of fact, openly stated, we're going to sell it and have like a strip mall there. Right? So that's what they said. And so the, actually the community said, no, we want a park. OK, if we have to share it with black people. Uh, but, we, but, but the trustee says, no, you see, like, it's our obligation to execute this person's will, right? And that can't be done legally anymore. So, okay. So luckily, in the law, there is something called cypres, C-Y-P-R-E-S. It's a Latin term. Okay. Now, so I, I think that's how you pronounce it, right? So cypres says, this is going to happen once in a while, right? You're going to have some old geezer who leaves his money to something, and one of them is like something we now think is bad um, or illegal. And if that happens, the right thing to do is to drop just the one thing that is illegal and then keep executing their wishes, right? That's the thing that w is right by the law. This is actually true of most states, okay? And so the NAACP actually took that line <laughs> Right, that you could still execute the will of this person, but just drop it. So, I, so last night I actually looked at the Supreme Court arguments, and it's really interesting. They, it, they started getting like metaphysical about things, and here's how they here's how, here's how the arguments go. Right. So here's the um, this is the NAACP argument. Um, there are three wishes, right, stated in the will. That there's a park, that it's for white people and not black people, <laughs> three things, right? Just drop one, <laughs> and you still have two, because it's still a park, and it's still for white people, it's just also for black people, right? So, and, and um, they lost that in Georgia court, right? And so when it was appealed to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court had to like, do we uphold the Georgia decision or not, right? And then, so the other side said, no, there aren't three claims, there's one claim, <laughs> namely, it's a park for whites and not blacks. <laughs> like, right? So, so, it was, so you see how weird this is? That like, if you're a, like you're at a Supreme Court or you're a lawyer, you have to like, wait, is it three or is it one? Like most of us go, what, what are you talking about, <laughs> right? Like, but but that's that's the point in the law that you, like, that, that's what it comes down to. Some of you might be attorneys or studying to be attorneys. Like that's what things come down to. Like is it three or one? Is it three wishes? Is it one wish? Is this an executable two wish seed or is it an executable three? All right. Here's what's not on the table in this Georgia court or 
the Supreme Court. What's not on the table is, what do we want now? What's good for the city now? Right? Fuck what this guy thought. <laughs> right? Like that was 50 years ago at this point, right? Um, that's not how things work in American law, right? It is what is closest to Senator Bacon's uh, wishes. Is it that you drop one of the three? Or, wait, since I, right? So this was an, so the Supreme, the Georgia court argued, well, he really, really wanted to have a segregated park. We can't have that now, right? And so, he would have just dropped the whole thing altogether and given it to his heirs, right? That was the judgment, right? Whether you agree with it or disagree with it, that was the judgment of the court, and that's the, that's the, um, that's the decision of the Supreme Court, right? And so right today, there's this little strip mall. It's, again, fun to do. Go to Google, look up Baconsfield Park. It'll point you to this little region in Google Maps. You drop a person in, and you can look around. It's like a Kroger and like a subway and like, like this, like, you know, like big, long highway. It was it's pretty disgusting. Um, anyways, uh, so that's, a, that, that's telling, right? Um, a, a similar thing happened a few states away, and this was the main story on the first episode of my podcast, if you want to listen to it, about the Hershey, uh, Hershey chocolate case, right? So if, if those of you who listen to the show, um, so Milton Hershey of, Hershey of Hershey's chocolate had a very similar bequest, right? And his bequest was that, you, um, that, that all of his money and the entire chocolate fortune and the entire um, Hershey's theme park fortune would go to an orphan school for white boys only. So this one was precluding girls, not just like, for white people, it's for white boys only. Okay, what happened in Pennsylvania was that when the Civil Rights um, Act was passed, by C. Prey, they decided that rather than closing the school, they would let girls and people of color in, right? And they said that was consistent with the wishes of Milton Hershey, right? Um, the problem in that case is very different from the problem in, in Macon, Georgia. In Macon, Georgia, there was, was there three wishes or just one? Is the wish consistent with overturning and just getting rid of the park completely or like dropping one of them? In Hershey, the problem was that uh, the Hershey company and the theme park company became very successful between um, 1945 when Hershey died and today. So you have this little school which had about 1,000 orphans in them, and that school's endowment is now $12 billion today. Right? I don't know if you know that that's a lot of money, but, <laughs> but when, so, it's, so it's the gross GDP of Haiti like in one year. Uh, like Vassar's endowment is one billion, right? So it's like 12 times the size. Um, but really telling is I went down there to, to, to do the story for the podcast, and um, when I called it, they had a public relations office, right? This is a school of 1,000. Think about like your local public school or your fancy wealthy private school. They had a 12-person PR team each making about $230,000, and all they made were YouTube videos of like Hershey School. And most of them came from the local Channel 11 like news team. So they're really good looking, you know, like anchors like look really nice, you know? They're like really, so they were like really good looking. I was like, wow. Right? The problem in that case is one of, if anything, economic injustice. Right? You have a little school that has a $12 billion endowment, right? And, um, you know, the, each student per pupil spending is 330000 a year. 330000 a year, right? Anyways, <laughs> okay. Uh, so those are the two stories. And um, so, so what is going on, right? What's going on is you have a, so one way of looking at it is um, like biologically, right? There's a bunch of apes, us, right? And the apes are saying, that ape wanted this, that ape died 100 years ago, but we got to do that. That's just like literally absurd to think about, right? But then here's another way of describing, right? There's an entire legal system and uh, of state enforcement of the wishes of the dead, right? With respect to private property, right? And that's important because it's not respect to other kinds of things, right? One thing I want to have you think about right now is um, because the team at Olia said, make them think about something, talk a little bit about something, and then come back. So one thing I want you to think about is how would this apply if we thought that the, in, in addition to the property rights of individuals, say voting rights extend after death? 
okay? Now, talk amongst yourself for just a few minutes about what implications that has. If the dead could will voting right, preferences eternally into the future. Now, think about that, for, right? So, talk amongst yourselves. Okay, <laughs> let's reconvene. And I'd like to ask you to share what considerations or what questions came up in the discussion of what would happen if we gave the dead voting rights, which is to say, give you voting rights even after you're dead. Yeah. Well, so something that we just talked about now, actually, was how do you categorize what counts as their vote? So if we're saying like Democratic versus Republican, for example, somebody spent 50 years voting Democratic, and then the last two years of their life, they voted Republican, and then they died. Does their vote count as Republican in perpetuity, or because they spent more time voting as Democratic, would you count them as a Democratic vote? Well, I would imagine that you would solve it the same way we did with people's money, is like, you have to will it. Like, it'd have to be like written in legally binding so, text. Like, this is the, this is the thing that I, I want done. Right, and, right. So, and then a, a second thought to that is, so then how far back do we allow this to be included? Like, do you get grandfathered in, or do you say starting now, you have to include it in your will, and then from the moment you die starting 2019, then it gets enacted? Or would you say, well, my grandfather voted Democrat his whole life, can I count his vote and I'll start in the next election? Any other considerations? Yeah. And you can't, you can't vote for issues, right? You have to vote for a person. So like, say you voted for this one person, but then they switch parties and they you know, do vote completely differently. So then your will just practically is implemented. I would imagine that you can do it any way you wanted to. Right? Like with your money? Like if you think about, like what, if you say, well, what do you want with your money? It's like, I wanted to go to City College. No, I wanted to go to, like, my pet, Lhasa Apso. Right? Like you can do that, right? So I would imagine you could say, you could say the party, you could say an individual, you could say, like, well, I'll, I don't know if the parties are going to stay the same. Whoever's a white separatist. That, right? You, could do, you can do that. Or you could, you know, whoever is against welfare. Like I, I would imagine you would do it the same way. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Did you have? Hold on. Uh, so that was the sort of thing that we made is, yeah. uh, are you going to uh, count those votes in terms of like ideology or political affiliation? Because a Democrat from the 1940s is not the same as a today. <laughs> right. Uh, right. You could, you could imagine there could being a court case. Right, like not to you. Right, like if if we had this system, right, and you had a whole state of people like voting Democrat, and then you can imagine the Democrats saying, "Hey, they they would have changed their mind if like you know today, right?" Just like most of the, or they could have said the Republicans would argue, right, and then it would just be a power grab as to whether to count it as one or the other, right? You would see similar kinds of problems arise, but we still do one and don't do the other. Yeah. I I also imagine that a whole, like, these privileges or these rights would only be benefited, uh, only, like, the people who already have power would benefit from it, because, firstly, like, I bet there's a ton of legal jargon that you have to understand to, like, frame it in the right way so that your court case could be won in favor of what your intention was, as well as, you know, in the same way a will can get taxed, you can probably, like, tax that vote in some way. There's, like, some way to make it taxable, and if you can't pay the registration fee, then like your vote won't count after you die. In the back? Um, I think also um, a point that we were talking about was just the, you know, how do you ensure that the, your heir is going to vote the way that you do? And I, I think that you are stunting someone else's personal belief system by imposing on them. Like, you're, you have grandpa's vote, and grandpa believed in these things and this ideology and so your whole life you're not thinking about how you would vote you're thinking about upholding these wishes of the vote for somebody who is you know long gone yeah you see you see how i was thinking about it was this right grandpa gets a vote and you get a vote right and so all the dead you would tabulate what they thought right and f by the way you can imagine an election where you're like, here's how the dead vote, and you already knew it before Dece November 6th, right? <laughs> right? And so this is what you need to do to overcome the dead vote, right? Right? Is it sounding even worse now than, than right? Yeah. Yeah. 
right there. I, I can imagine this happening when we get to the point where we can, you know, like upload our consciousness. <laughs> right? Because then it's like, well, you have philosophy all of my decision making process yeah. in this computer, so why should I not be able to vote? That's right. Because I'm dead. Yeah. Yeah. Last consideration. Yeah, I wonder if it would also be a, like a restructuring of what counts as what the minimum page requirement is to vote as well. Because if you're going to give the right to vote to someone who is dead, and then still say, well, actually, if you're 17 years old, if you're not allowed to vote, but somebody who's been dead for 50 years, their vote still counts. I wonder if there would be a change in structure, or at least a challenge to that idea as well. Because you're not a, an adult till you're 18, but you could have been dead for 100 years and you can still vote. I, th I think that even with, with just another three minutes, we can list all of the injustices that are involved in having a system like this, right? That, that we don't act, and nobody's proposing this, and right, whatever. Um, funnily enough, the founding fathers were worried about this, right? They were worried about having political power um, amongst the dead, because that was an open consideration for various reasons that I can talk about in the Q&A. Um, OK. What I really want to talk about is, given that we all agree that in the case of political rights, like the right to vote, this is an absurd proposal for, vi for, for a list of reasons that we can all come up with. We are perfectly happy doing this with economic power, right? namely money. Right? When we have uh, a huge set of wishes in bank accounts, and what we call trust, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and what people are doing is implementing the wishes of the dead, right? as it has been stated in a will 50 years ago, 75 years ago, 100 years ago. Um, we're doing this exact same thing. right? Because if you think about it, what would, what would happen in nature? <laughs> Right? Or what would happen? Like there's and actually something you can test, right? Every other animal species, right? Well, once somebody is dead, they don't have property because they're dead, right? And you might imagine like there might be chaos, like free-for-alls or whatever. But what doesn't happen is a bunch of people using the power of the state, including the power to jail and fine, right, to punish individuals for not executing those ways. That's what we don't have, right? And in fact, we don't have that much in other countries either. Right? There's only a few of them, the ones that are based on English common law, right? Britain, Australia, America. So today I'm going to, so for the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about the way it works in the law. And then, because this is a philosophy talk, we'll talk about the justice of the practice, right? Where it comes from, what the justification given is, and then we can talk about, you know, at the end of the day, um, how much of this is going on, right? And I've already given it away. Sometimes when you start tugging, you see, once you start seeing it somewhere, you see it everywhere. And then you start tugging at it, meaning if we got rid of the practice, a lot of things would have to go with it. So let's talk a little bit about how it works in the law. This is just like the factual part of the talk. Um, the conditional bequest, the, co the conditional bequest is something in the law. It's really um, rather amusing to think about um, sometimes. And it's, it's exactly as it sounds. You give your money on the condition of something, right? So consistent with the law now, you can like, you could grant your grandchildren your fortune, but only if they marry a Catholic or something, right? Like that's actually legal, right? Um, you can, um, and this is a true story, because a lot of these are true stories. Um, you can say, this school must be named after me, and even if it'll go bankrupt, like you can't change the name. Right? This happened at Paul Smith College in the Adirondacks about two years ago. So the billionaire Joan Weil, the Weils are Capital Bank, Capital One or something like that, um, offered to save the school if they would change their name to Paul Smith Joan Weil College. The college said, yeah, save the school. <laughs> right? And the court said, no, 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 wishes of Paul Smith. <laughs> Right? You've got to be named after, like if you're going to be on this land, this was his land, he granted it to you. So you can't change the name, and the Wilds went, okay, no money. Um, so right now, they're like right on the brink of like, you know. Okay. Um, you know, there was a man in Texas who bequeathed his wife the fortune on the grounds that she smoked five cigarettes a day. Um, because she would nag him all the time for to, to have to quit smoking, and he, like, and and so she took it to court, and the court ruled, "What can you do?" <laughs> it's like listed on the. It's a famous case in San Antonio, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, think about it, right? Like, 
before this talk, you, you just went, whoa, right? But like the reasoning is, well, what can you do? You can just not take the money, right? Like, okay. Uh, so that's the conditional bequest. Uh, there is the uh, charitable trust, right? And uh, this is actually officially what uh, Hershey's is, right? It's, a, it's officially a charity uh, institution for orphan children now that act ends up owning like the entire Hershey chocolate fortune and theme park fortune, right? That's their portfolio of investments, but it's actually a charitable trust, right? Um, so charitable trust, like they're interesting because um, you know, they have to be considered charitable, right? So you can't have the charitable trust towards book burning, right, or something like that. But, but, but outside of that, you know, there's a lot, it's pretty broad in terms of what counts as charitable. So, um, so I was reading this book that I got a lot of this information from. Um, there's a charitable trust for the care of abandoned guinea pigs. There's the charitable trust for Huey military aircraft. There's the charitable trust, um, sorry, there's, there, so the guinea pig, so why would there be like a huge trust going to guinea pigs? Um, it's actually a mechanism by which you can have your children employed Right, so like if you start a charity and it like, there's no part of the law that says a, a certain percentage has to go to guinea pigs, right? It just says that a certain percentage has to be spent a year on, on a purpose. And as long as there's some guinea pig action going on in the trust, you're good. So your CEO can make $400,000 a year, right? And the guinea pigs could, you know, you could care for like a few guinea pigs, but that's, that's kosher, <laughs> that's okay. Right. All right. Um, the final one I want to talk about. Is, um, so, so there's other things like. Um, so that's a kind of mix between. So um, the part where you see this the most is with universities and hospitals and museums. Right. So you have wealthy people who say, um, I want a wing, and that's only for the care of this kind of cancer. Right. Or I want a professor, and this is absolutely true, who studies psychic phenomena. Right? There's actually three institutions that have that. There's like, and you can't hire that anymore because nobody studies psychic phenomena because there's nothing to study. But they actually have like a growing endowment, right? That's just sitting in the bank that you can't spend on anything else, right? You can't like go to mental health services or anything, anything like that. Why? Because like there's this document that says this was the intent of the donor that it has to go to an en endowed professorship for parapsychological parapsychologi studies. Um, so th this happens the most in like those areas. Okay. The last one I want to talk about, um, which is the one that gets me most um, worked up, is, is called the Dynasty Trust. Um, so uh, this is an instrument that was designed very recently uh, in the 90s, uh, 80s and 90s. So here's how this, this works. Uh, so the Dynasty Trust is an individual who Actually, here's a better way to explain it. You guys read, it's a bookstore, you guys read like Jane Austen and like 18th, 19th century, right? So you'll know that there's a common plot in those novels where like the house and estate was, has to go to some cousin, like even though like the dad is like owning and they're like, but it's like to some kind, and you're like, what the, f like, what is weird feudal thing? Okay, that's what a dynasty trust is, right? So I'll tell you what it is, okay? So, <laughs> Though the thing that I told you about in the 19th century was, a, was the remnants of a feudal system, which was um, like somehow God passed down, told you how property was supposed to be like passed down amongst generations. And, um, and so nobody really owned it, right? It was, it belongs to a lineage. Does that make sense? Right? It, it doesn't belong to you even though you're the person in the lineage. Right? So you can't decide that you're going to pass it to somebody else. Like the lineage state, it has to be like the second cousin of you know, Elizabeth or something. Right? Okay. So the dynasty trust is a trust that a wealthy individual can put all their money in. Not, sorry, not money. Assets. Assets that can grow. Right? It could be stocks. It could be bonds. Um, what, they, what people started using was um, life insurance policies. So you buy a million dollar life insurance policy. You put it in your trust, and it's worth 10 million when you die. Boom, you already got 10 million for your heirs, right? So they started putting these things in, and what you do is this particular trust, you can stipulate that it doesn't belong to any person in the future. You stipulate the lineage, like ahead of time, right? And it doesn't have to even be a lineage. It could be something like whoever is an alcoholic doesn't get it. 
um, whoever is, um, uh, you know, so almost always it's um, the individual's family, but there are stipulations that you can put in. Sometimes just pretty arbitrary stipulations, right? If they marry somebody Jewish, no money. Like you're allowed to put these kinds of things in that trust. Okay, so that's the first part. Here's the second part of the dynasty trust. Subsequent people who inherit money from the trust, that money cannot be subject to legal liability. What does that mean? You can't be sued and lose money from the trust. If you like hit a you know, like light pole and owe money, the state can't come after money in the trust, right? So you can have, in, you can have people who have a set of money, like a, a bunch of money in a pot that they're going to inherit, and that's not subject to the government doing anything with, like, no matter like how bad you act. So you can't be sued and the money comes out of the trust. You can be sued, but they can't go after trust funds. The trust fund money is exempt from that. Okay, what's the justification? The justification is, it's not this person's money, even though they can get the, the money, right? It belongs to like the lineage that's stipulated by the person who put the money in there. That's a dynasty trust. Okay, that's why it's called a dynasty, right? So, um, so what this, de facto does is gives a small class of people who are heirs in the dynasty, like a, f a, a citizen status that's different from everybody else, right? If you can go around um, doing wrongs but not be subject to lawsuits or fines from that money, then you occupy a certain different kind of status right, in the society that's different from the people who don't have that. Okay, uh, these are the three um, mechanisms that um, the dead use to, um, and basically, this is the way that you get the state to execute your wishes, right? If you have enough money to go into these trusts, you can guarantee that there is a, a person who works at the DA's office locally that will see to it that, for how long? That's the next part of it. For, let's just say, 100 years to forever, after your death, what you wanted to do with your money is done, okay? now. What is ownership, anyways, right? What is the kind of thing, it's a philosophy talk, we gotta talk about, if you think about it, ownership is just the rights and obligations that other people have with respect to a certain kind of thing, right? Like, do I own this? Uh, no, I don't own this, and that's because I don't have a legal, I don't have a moral right to take it with me or do with it what I wish. But if I did, I have the right to like destroy it. Another way of putting it is, what is it to own it except have the set of legal rights? Right, that an individual and other individuals have. You don't own this because you have a certain set of obligations with respect to this podium. Right? You can't just destroy it or defeat right? it. Um, the Strand does because like, they have those obligations. So in a very real sense, not a metaphorical sense, the dead still own a lot of money and property. <laughs> right? right? So they own it and they're earning. Right, because that money is invested in stocks, bonds, properties, other assets. Um, they own it because nobody else, else has an obligation to do with that money, legally speaking, as they wish. Everybody must do it according to what the dead person wanted. Okay, so that's the first point that I wanna make. Um, all right, the second point that I wanna make is that this isn't just a theoretical, this can be a real problem long term. Because what, as you all know, <laughs> we've been talking about this for a long time now, wealth inequality is increasing and not decreasing, right? So you're going to have more and more of the total wealth in a society concentrated in people who, can, who have the power, right, to have the law execute their wishes forever between 100 years and forever. We'll talk about that in a second, um, right? So there's gonna be, right? So, so moving into the future, there is going to be 
economic power, not even amongst the rich living, <laughs> right? It'll be amongst the rich dead, right? And the more, if you think about how much wealth the wealthiest people have, you think about the Jeff Bezoses of the world and, and so on, um, if that wealth is carved out and s taken out of the economy for 100 to forever and allowed to grow, and you gotta do what Jeff Bezos said to do with that, right? That is a serious harm on the total economy, right? You're gonna have a growing and a large sector of the economy, not even dedicated, like if you're like this free market capitalist, right, and you think, yeah, you know, I'm for free market capitalism, you're not gonna like this either. <laughs> Right? Because what, what does this look like to you? It's gonna look like the government enforcing the wishes of dead people with respect to wealth and not money in the market where people are like competing for it and using it for assets, right? right? And if you're not a free market fundamental, if you like, have any socialist tendencies or anything like that, you're definitely gonna not like this either, right? Because it's a certain kind of inequality that is almost inexplicable. You can say, you, you can make an argument even though it might not be true, that the living have earned what it is that they have, right? What's the argument for 100 years ago somebody had earned something, and because they did, we have to keep doing what they want now? Okay, so uh, let's talk about the justice of the practice. Um, so how long can people do this for? Okay, so it used to be roughly around 100 years. Right? There was something in the law called the rule of, the rule of perpetuities, which was, um, the official statement of it is called is, uh, lives in being plus 21 years, right? Lives in being plus 21 years. If you are in law school, that's going to be on the bar, I promise you, because it stumps people all the time. Um, lives in being plus 21 years means whoever is alive to be affected by your money with the time that you die, their whole life plus 21 years, okay? That used to be the case. Why? That was the case since, wow, oh gosh, 13th century in English common law. Why? For exactly the reasons why, that I've stated, right? People were aware very quickly that if it was any longer than that, it, you would have a serious injustice of people like 200 years ago who had all this wealth that you can't do anything with under the law. Okay, that's changed in America, and it's changed more or less in the 90s state by state started, um, started repealing the rule of perpetuities. Uh, and so currently we have, I think, you can check me, check, about 27 states where you no longer have this constraint that you can control the world for lives and being plus 21 years, 100 years, meaning that you can go on forever, right? In the law it says wait and see. Um, it's a good, it's an interesting story as to why. The, the short answer is, their Delaware started and Alaska started doing this to attract rich people's money to their banking system. And as soon as that happened, other states go, we're gonna get rid of our per rule of perpetuities, right? Not seeing, <laughs> right? Not, see, not seeing the future in a way that like the medieval feudal lords <laughs> in Britain saw the future of where this could be. So in, and, th and they did this in England and they did this in Australia. So currently in many states in, the, in America, in English and Australia, it can go on forever, right? So forever, right? Okay, the justice of the practice. Where does this, what is the philosophical justification that one can give for doing something that seems if you compare it to voting or like seriously unjust? It comes from um, something called freedom of testation, right? It's a very simple argument. And the argument is when you have property, you are free to give it the way that you want. Right? That's one right that you have when you have property. Okay, second, second premise of the argument, giving something away after you're dead is just a gift, a deferred gift, but a gift nonetheless, right? So you can have it, but after I'm dead. That's a gift, but just deferred. Conclusion, you are free to defer, to, to give a deferred gift according to anything that you wish, okay? That's it, that's the justification for it. It all reduces to freedom of testation, right? 
why do we have this freedom, the argument goes, because people are free to refuse a gift. And if they're free to refuse the gift, then you're free to you know, put any condition that you want on the gift. Okay, I'll give you two minutes. Think about that kind of argument and then see if it actually has the implications that it has where there's nothing we can do about these practices at charitable, conditional bequests and dynasty trust. We gotta keep doing it because hey, freedom of testation. It's part of our concept of private property. Okay, okay. <laughs> Let's reconvene. <laughs> Who wants to share? What you were talking Does freedom of testation make sense? And if it does, does it justify the practices that we have been kind of <gasps> taking deep breaths and gasps about, yeah. I mean, we, we think it makes sense given the system of common law we've inherited and that we're like indoctrinated, or like, you know, that we're forced into by just being born into the United States. We have consent to the laws, but we were thinking more actually about like, okay, so if we say this is ridiculous, then maybe you can't give anything to children. Uh, your, your state, you can't pass down, which we're saying is probably for the best of society. I mean, um, if you can't gift anything because, you know, these billions of dollars are tied up and they're not going to people in social welfare programs and things like that. Can I ask a more basic question? Um, so, outside of the whole, you know, we're indoctrinated into a system thing. If somebody has something, like a child has a toy and it's theirs, can they give it a, right? Can they, morally speaking, give it to in any way that they want, right? That is, do they have the right to do with it what they want to do with it if it's genuinely, gen, genuinely theirs, right? So the idea is supposed to be that the very basic notion of what it is to own something, it follows from this, that you're free to testate according to your own wishes, and that death is just a deferred thing. So um, the, the idea is that the law makes sense because we have this moral principle, not that we have this moral principle because we've been indoctrinated into the law. That's the claim anyways. The claim is that the philosophical justification for the practice in the law is that very basically, morally speaking, we have this notion of ownership and that with ownership comes the right to give to whoever you want under whatever conditions. Okay, yes in the back. Um, we were talking <laughs> but even with the gift that you give someone, and you're like, I'll give this to you if you do this, even if you're alive, how do you make sure they're doing it? We were talking about the five cigarettes thing. <laughs> Who's going to come into their house every day and make sure she's smoking five cigarettes? Yeah, true, true. There's the, the enforcement issue is always an issue. That's why if you look at Hershey and what they call with the money, it's like, ooh. Mm. I think going to orphans, right? <laughs> right? And you know that's why you end up getting lawsuits and the people. But right, think about it. The lawsuits are always dead person wanted this, dead person wanted this, <laughs> right? But you're right. There's an enforcement issue, Monica. Um, we have, we have two two strands of that. One was, and I might be butchering this, is a constant imperative where it's like you can do whatever you want until like it hits my nose, basically. Like, so <laughs> the idea, yeah. butchering it, but um, the idea that like you can give a gift, but you have, you're free to do with it whatever you want with it unless it causes harm. Yeah. Isn't that kind of the rule of law? But then proving that it's causing harm is a whole other thing. But then yeah. the, the, other yeah, point, the other point the other point being, um, what if what if you own what you own at the point of you die, you can bequeath whatever whatever it is that you have, but then whatever gets burned on top of that after you die doesn't belong to you. That that argument. Yeah, so good. So one of the reactions is that we actually aren't in ordinary life limit, limitless in terms of the conditions we put on our gifts. Right? If we're talking about morality here, right? If I say, right, um, go smack my brother in the face and I'll give this to you. Like that's wrong, <laughs> right? Like, and, it's not, and it's not wrong because of like, it's, it's just wrong, right? Or, you know, like I have this really good nine millimeter, you know, like pistol and like you, Okay, here, I'm gonna give it to you, right? Like there are moral constraints on gifting also, right? And so that it's not completely unconstrained with respect to um, um, just ordinary moral rights to property. 
Right? The other thing that, that is worth thinking about and that's really at the core of the issue as far as I'm con con concerned is, sorry, I should have okay, is, um, I, like, I like speaking like this, um, is, um, you know, if I give, if I, if I give my, um, you know, my favorite pair of jeggings to you, right? Right? And then I get that successfully, right? Um, then I can't thereby, right, give my pair of jeggings to you because I've already given them away. That is, you've alienated your property and that's one of the conditions under which you can't give it anymore, right? The argument for free testation assumes that dying doesn't alienate you from your property, <laughs> right? Like that's what it does, it says like you can, you can, on the condition that I die, I give this to you. Why isn't that like on the condition that I've given it to her, then I give it to you? Like that's, that's, that, that doesn't make sense, that's a contradiction. If you give it to her, then you can't give it to you, right? You're, like your jeggings are you know, over here. Um, so similarly, if you thought that death was the end of a person, period, then you would say that at that point you don't own the stuff. So you can't beforehand decide to defer after a time when you don't own the stuff anymore, right? So then the question is, do you just stop owning stuff when you're dead, right? And this comes, like, it comes down to like the most serious of all the philosophical questions. What ends at death? Like what ends, right? Because I think all of you were convinced by the little exercise that we did in the first part that political rights do, right? I think you, all of you said, Voting rights most definitely end at death, okay? I don't even want to consider that question about why it's just or unjust, right? Okay, that ends, okay? Another kind of property right does end at death too, right? It's the right, so say you own a business, right? And you say, my business, I will never sell my uh, gadgets in Japan. I don't like the Japanese. You're free to do that as a CEO, right? And especially if you found the business and you're the founder, right? No legal court or no legal system, no trade group is gonna enforce that wish after you die. It's just not in the realm of possibilities that a CEO can say, hey, it's my company, I own it. You never do business in Japan, right? And that, that's not part of our system, right? Okay, but with respect to personal wealth, we think it is. Right? You can say, the money will never go to the Japanese, and then, well, nothing we can do about that. Okay? So in other realms, we think things end at death. Okay? Property, we don't. Now, is there anything special about property, that make, or private property, that we think is different from the case of political rights? I don't think there is. Right? I actually want to argue that we don't have any obligations or rights to the dead at all in any possible way. But I'm extreme in this, right? I don't, not that many people believe it, and certainly the whole entire weight of American, British, and Australian law doesn't think so. In fact, they think the opposite, right? A lot of people in the university says, our hands are tied. Like at my college, there's, a, there's an endowment for uh, a, a professor who professes, who, who commits to proselytizing the Christian faith. Right? Like there's an endowment that's growing and then like we haven't hired anybody for like 50 years, right? But like the dean's hands are tied. Like I can't do anything about it. Why, right? Okay, so I'm gonna talk about one last argument and then we're gonna do Q&A because I've gone on long enough. And that is the, one of the dominant views in philosophy about this issue, which is that, um, that it's, it's, a it's not a matter of property, it, it's a matter of what they call posthumous harm, that you can hurt the dead, right, um, by not satisfying their wishes. There, there's actually something to this. Don't laugh, because I, 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 I disagree with it also. But, but, but the idea is something that I think is very um, prominent in, um, in human thinking. So for instance, um, why would it be wrong to spread malicious lies about someone who died? So they say they start with cases like that, right? Like so, Elvis is dead. And they can go on and on about, you know, false things about what. But people say that's wrong, right? Um, if a dying man says, um, "Please give this locket to my grandson," and then he dies, and then you say, "Ah, fuck it," <laughs> right? Then you're a, then you're an asshole. But why? Why, right? Like he's dead. He can't. You know, he, he broke a promise to the guy. 
um, right? But like, it doesn't harm him, right? According to this view, like, no, we have to explain the wrongness of these broken promises to individuals, right? And the way that we explain it is that you are harming them in some way, right? The tricky thing is, who are you harming, right, if they're already dead, right? But I think we all agree, at least, that we're pulled by that judgment. Like, it seems, like, really bad for people to be insulting dead people, and it seems pretty bad to be breaking our promises to dead people, and this comes up, we're in a bookstore, you know, so, you know, um, and what I'll be, do you guys know all the, like the, uh, Franz Kafka? So there's all these uh, artists and authors who said, um, said, burn it. I wasn't ready to release this, you know, this big body of work. Uh, I don't want it released, do not release it. Okay, of course they don't have the same kind of power as the rich people do to have it enforced. But then like, you're the person who's been bequeathed Kafka's, you know, like, oeuvre, and he says, burn it, okay? You know, on the right, it's 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 iffy. It's iffy, right? It's iffy, right? It's iffy. It, it's not obvious. Now, if it were true that there was no possible way that you can harm the dead, the right answer would be. I think actually think this is the right answer. Would be okay. Forget about what they wanted. Let's just see if this is good to do. I think that's the right thing to say. But I'm not completely um, unsympathetic to the view that, no, we should consider it. We actually should consider what they wanted, right? Because violating that is some kind of harm to them, right? All right, so last thing, and then we'll end and we'll have a discussion. What do we want to say about this? Okay, uh, I, do th I do think there's something here. What I don't think is, is here is the language of harm, like harm, I don't think that's the right way to characterize what's going on when we say insult the dead or like throw away, like somebody writes a book manuscript, it's terrible, but they say publish it for me, publish it for me, right? Like if you just go like that, then you're an asshole, right? Like that's, there's something to the idea that you did something bad, okay? Did it harm them? I don't know if that's the right way to describe it. Here's, 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 here's how I would, um, here's, here's how I prefer to think about it. Um, so the philosopher, uh, Sam Scheffler, who's at NYU, not too far from here, actually very close to here, um, has this book called Death in the Afterlife. It's a wonderful book. If it's here, I suggest that you buy it. So two things I suggest you do, buy Death in the Afterlife, and then listen to my podcast, Hi-Fi Nation. Um, is, um, and he argued that what seems to be essential to human beings who value things, who have values, um, what it means to value something is for that value to persist in a world um, after you die, that is, in a world in which there are still human beings around where, where that value persists. So um, what, is, what is it to value, um, you know, you wrote a manuscript. Right? Now, what is that person's value that they want that thing to survive after their death? If you just burn the manuscript, right, what have you done? Well, what you've done is you've made the entire practice that that person participated in like this meaningless thing. Right? You've made it meaningless. That is, what that shows is that um, human beings are doing certain things and what it is for their lives to be meaningful to them, right, is for those things in some way to survive, even after the death of their own bodies, right? So what you do in frustrating that is you are, frust you are making their lives less meaningful than it would be if you didn't do that. Okay, so I think that's right. Right? I, th I, don't think that's, I don't think that's wrong. I think that a lot of our practices, right? So, you know, here, here's, a, here's a, uh, uh, a thought experiment that, that Scheffler gave in his book. S some of you might be really concerned with electoral reform, right? You're like, I want to reform the What if I told you that, the, that the, a comet's going to hit the earth actually in 2020, right? And everybody's going to die. Are you still going to work for electoral reform? And you're like, uh, yeah, it's, it's like I got other priorities then, right? It's like not that, it's the fact it's not valuable when there's an end to something and foreseeable end to it. There's got to be an indeterminate future in which the thing that you're working towards is still going to be around and there are people here, right? So if I told you, you're not, 
keep doing what you're doing, but you're not gonna see the benefits of it. It's gonna be two generations after you die. You probably still do it, right? Knowing the world will still be here and there'll still be a country. But you won't do it if the whole world's gonna end, right? So the idea that there's an indeterminate future of human beings who are there to value the same kind of thing, experience it, is part of the meaningful life. And frustrating people's wishes is a way of frustrating that. Okay, so I like, I think that's correct. What I don't think is that by frustrating it, you are harming somebody who's already dead, right? And I also don't think that we have an obligation to make past people's lives as meaningful as possible. I actually don't think that's true either, right? I, I don't think that one among the obligations you have morally, I, one of them is to make past people's lives very meaningful. Right? It might be one among many, but it's not like a primary obligation. And then the final thing I would say about this is that um, if somebody's wishes going on, you can frustrate them by, carrying, by not carrying them out, there's also the possibility that by carrying them out, you actually do something that is for the world kind of bad. Right? And I think that that's what happens when you carry out the wishes of, like, when you don't ask yourself the question, is this good now that we do this? Rather than asking the question, if you, right? So right now we ask the question, what did this person want? What did Bacon want? What did Hershey want? Right? That's what the courts are asking. If you don't, if you only ask that question, then you're prioritizing their meaningfulness at the cost of possible harms that you could be doing to actual living human beings now in the interest of carrying out their wishes. So what you've end up doing, ended up doing is making their lives in the past worse, right? By trying to make them more meaningful by carrying out their wishes, you've actually done something where now Hershey and now Bacon has done something bad in the world and you've done it in their name. Okay, so just, so if you thought that there was a way we could harm the, the dead, then you should be really concerned about this practice too, of perpetuating the wishes of the dead eternally. Okay, I'm done, uh, let's have a discussion. <laughs> Q&A. Yep. Yeah, I have yep. a, a few questions. The first is, um, What's the, the higher purpose that preserving the sanctity of private property, you know, what's it serving? And you kind of, your take was, you know, giving people the opportunity to lead a meaningful life is having this indeterminate future where their actions will persist. Yeah. But do you think that the incentive to work hard and, you know, um, amass private property as a constructive force, as a force for social cohesion, do you think that's also something that was factored into common law? As in like, we will reward you for amassing this private property because your generations after will benefit. And the second question is, you said that if you have this private property that's passed over and you get to decide to do something, good or bad with it, what kind of legal mechanism are you thinking? Because the person in charge of that property who knows that person who's bequeathing it, they have a kind of an information advantage of yeah. you know, what they would want. Yeah, can I answer the second one first? Yeah. So the second one is, um, you know, so the person I learned a lot of this from, which is this um, lawyer named Ray Madoff, she has a book called Immortality and the Law, where I got a lot of this information from. Um, a lot, she's pretty cynical about it. She says, look, if there were any changes, people, rich people will just find a way around it anyways. Like, so instead of bequeathing their property after they're dead, um, they'll just do it all like right before they die and so on. Okay. Um, and, and, uh, and you know, there's, there, there, there's something to that, but I'm actually not that... Um, pessimistic about that. Um, I think that underestimates the selfishness and greed of rich people. Um, and the reason why I think that, I'm sorry if you're rich. <laughs> like, this is not like a, a way of shitting on rich people. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, it's, I'm just asking them to think morally about, you know, what, what they do with their stuff. Um, the, so there, I think there's a reason why people don't do that now. You could do that now. Right, um, you could just like before like, you die, um, but uh, number one, number one, you don't know when you're gonna die, 
or when you're going to lose your faculties, because you can't, like if you've lost your faculties and you, like, people challenge it in court, right? Number two, I think people are really committed to having their stuff with them and don't trust their kids. Like, this is actually not about inheritance, right? Um, a lot of rich people don't like their kids and like, don't even give their kids all that much. Um, but even if they do, some of them will do. I, I honestly don't think that it's going to have zero impact um, by making it impossible for people to give according to whatever they want. Um, I think that people are um, selfish enough to want to hold on to things in the last minute. Um, there's evidence for that. Um, there's only a few billionaires who have decided to spend their wealth down <laughs> towards the end of life. They're the exception. That's why there's New York Times stories about them. Most people just keep holding on to it, holding on to it, holding on to it. As they don't want to be lower on the list. Like that's really big. That's a, that's a bigger deal. Like ego, that kind of thing is a bigger deal than than not. Anyways, private property. There's a long historical story about why we have the private property laws that we do, connected with like England and you know owning property and capital industrial capitalism. Um, let's just put it this way: uh, there are plenty of societies without as strict a notion of private property than us, and people aren't significantly unhappier in them. So, anyways, other questions? Um, I wanted to make sure that I understood your bit about the, uh, like a CEO saying, I don't want any of my products sold in Japan, okay. and that some, that is enforceable, That's or it's, it's not enforceable once a person dies, okay. but like the, the stipulations put on a trust or a personal bequeathment somehow are enforceable. And I think from my perspective, you know, that could be justified by business is business and it makes a lot more people profit than, you know, if I just give my pen collection to Monica, and I'm like, but you can only use red glitter pens on this kind of stationery, right? Like, because it's only going to Monica, it's not going, it's not benefiting everybody else. But I also think that, like, handing down personal wealth, uh, it then invests whoever receives that money in the system, because suddenly, suddenly they have that money. And no matter where they were, they are now take over the place of whoever has died, right? And, and so I just, I think that when more people can profit off of something, that's when you can be like, forget John, the CEO, because he's gone now. And I've had a lot of thoughts about this in terms of like the way that we use icons like contemporary icons and how we bring people like Elvis into marketing campaigns today right like Elvis who's profiting off of Elvis's money and a lot of people and yeah, yeah. Freddie Mercury and all these other yeah. things and so Great it's yeah. it's it's a really interesting thing that I've been thinking a lot about is you know you have these high profile figures in our society and billions and billions of dollars are still made off of them. So who's, who's benefiting from that? Yeah. Even though I think like when Prince died, he didn't have a, he didn't go through like the final steps of legalizing his will, but he was like actually very, from what I've read, like he was like, I, I don't want mm -hmm. to be used in, in advertising or images or anything like that. When I'm gone, I'm gone. Yeah. Um. So the law around the use of icons and images of personalities is super fascinating, and I, I didn't get into it. So, somebody is, and that is susceptible to a time, like there's like, it's like 75 years or so, something like that, and that the, the, the estate of you know, the person like, gets, has all the things and is making a ton of money from that, and, and so on, so, so, that, so that's true. So, um, so, but it's, but it's, it's actually very interesting. Um, the, the first thing you said, I mean, business is business. You know. um, so my, my response is, I think that's right. 
And I think what that shows is that in the business case, there are constraints on executing the wishes of the dead. And those constraints are really clear. You've stated them, right? Um, in the case of private property, what I want to say is, it sh should be thought of as, the constraints should be thought of as at least as constraining as the case of the businesses. And it's not, right? Because in the case of businesses, you're like, well, a lot of people are affected by what this business does, right? And their interests can very quickly, very easily trump the interests of the dead person. Right? There's a lot of people in rural Pennsylvania and a lot of poverty there, right? And $13 billion can go a long way towards alleviating the problem. Or you could spend 330000 on one <coughs> school, right? But, that, but, that's, but you can't say that in the case of charitable trust, dynasty trusts, and conditional requests. But you cannot say in the law, look, nobody gives a shit about psychic research, <laughs> okay? So this $4, billion, $4 million endowment for hiring a professor there, like, like we have to do it on some, everybody feels like, what did you do? That's what the person gave because that's what he wanted. And we could have just turned it down. So you, that's another thing, right? That's the other part. That's the other part. You could just not work there in the business. And I see so many analogies that I want to say that how natural it is for you to think that business is business. It's constraining what we can do with the wishes of the dead in the business case. We should also see in the other case as well. There aren't zero constraints, right? You can't, you know, have, you know, give money only to people who burn books, right? There are something called public policy, but there are way, 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 way few, right? Hence, like bacon. Uh, over here. So I was wondering if this sort of boils down to what Um, if it boils down to contract law, because if I am like a wealthy person and I tell you that I want you to do something mm. versus me writing it down in my will, having it, you know, signed and notarized, do, does the obligation to enforce that change? It's trust law. So there's a, there's, a, there's, there's a specific set of laws surrounding death and use of property that's very different from, it's, you couldn't, I, I don't think ordinary contracts that's not in the trust system are enforceable <clears throat> after death in this, in this kind of way. Like, so like debts, for instance, like, like are actually technically enforceable, right? So that's a contract, you know, you, you run up the credit card tab, like you owe the money, right? But like you're dead now. But technically, actually, nobody has to pay that, right? So when like they start calling, you know, your family, the family doesn't have to actually pay that. So it's not just contract. But there might be something deeper behind your question. This <coughs> notion of uh, a binding agreement, like that very concept, is that the thing that's behind all of these wishes? Um, and I would say, I don't know, right? It all comes down to whether you think once somebody dies, everything ends or not. If you don't think that, then you're going to be inclined to think, oh, I hope this, right? And I think even if you're very super secular, you're still going to feel the pressure of like, no, I can't, I can't insult this person. Not around. Like that person's an asshole, right? Like you think, you think that, but why? Why do we, like, what is the pull of like still seeing that there's something owed to somebody who just died? Well, I think, well, personally, when you were speaking about that, I don't know if it's so much like asshole, like you're an asshole as much as it's like fear, right? Like it's the kind of the idea that like, I am fine thinking that about other people, but I um, but I don't want that to be thought about me with like my <laughs> own personal property. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And I think that that boils down. I mean, it, it, it's not exclusively theology or religion. I think there's a lot to be said about that, right? Because like, how do we? Why do we have burial rites for people? And why do we like? Oh, I want to be cremated and spread across the wind and like whatever, right? Like it's like all of those thoughts. Like we do that for people, and I think that that's based in like a fear of if I don't do this, I'll be cursed or like whatever. <laughs> but I. I think yeah. there's that, that kind of thought as well. Like, it's not so much like you're an asshole because you didn't like do this with my money. It's saying, if I don't do this, why would anybody do that for me Good. in the event that I have my own private property that I want something to happen with? Okay. Good. So there's another thing that I didn't even talk about, which is like, why are we doing my private property? We're the living, they're all dead. So we're the ones who are doing all of this stuff, right? <laughs> why are we doing it, right? And one explanation is because we want this done for us. 
right? Um, yeah, that's true. That, that is true. That's an explanation. It's not a justification, right? right? It's an explanation. I think that's very right. It has to do with, like, look, my, like, I can foresee my life being frustrated after I'm dead. Like, I did all this stuff. If someone just decides to insult me after I'm dead and, like, throw away my books and then, like, just put shit all over me all on the internet about me, then, like, I won't be there to experience it. But god damn, like, that frustrates the values that I have now, um, yeah, that, that is an explanation. Just one more. Just one more? Three minutes. Okay, and it's a quick one, too. Yeah. Um, this is not a justification either. It's more of an explanation, but flipping that around, I feel like the explanation that I'm seeing is less about, you know, what I fear after I'm dead, but more like, I'm alive and I benefit from the fact that we uphold this system of beliefs that enables me to accumulate a ton of money and my dynasty to accumulate a ton of money. And so it's the living that honor the dead's wishes in order to benefit from that. And, and, and I feel like part of the only way out of that is just to limit how much anyone can own. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That was a great thing to say. Uh, let's just do one more, because I want to make sure. <laughs> this one could be quicker. Uh, I was just wondering if you've investigated any societies that have the opposite, where basically anything, when you die, all of your estate goes to the state to do with however they please, oh, or it just disappears, yeah. or like what, how does that society work? What, it, it, does the money go anywhere? Like, you say that 18 billion in Pennsylvania could go to the rural workers. Is there a country that does that, you know? Um, so anthropologists have looked at this, right? And the dominant system is one of primogeniture. So it's like, automatically goes to children and so on. Um, free testation is only found in, Max Weber actually wrote about this in the two societies. One was like, um, Roman law of a certain era, and the English law, like no other societies have it. So it's something about the capitalism that kind of grows <laughs> in that system. Um, but no modern society that I know of, um, I actually looked at like communist Russia, and it, as far as I'm concerned, there was some kind of primogeniture, it's like automatically comes to children. That's different from what we're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's saying that, it, that, that somebody else has a right to your state, mm -hmm. right? And like you don't have a right to do with it, but you will. So I haven't, but it's worth looking at. <coughs> By the way, I haven't been arguing that it should all go to the state. You might have thought that, but I wasn't arguing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wasn't arguing. Um, or should it go to you? No, not to me. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I don't want to think. <laughs> Maybe next to Leo. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Yeah.